it, it, we, we got into this thing with the best intentions, really. I never... Oh, I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? Hello, everyone, and welcome to Back to the Frame Rate, a weekly podcast where we have a conversation about movies, reviews, news, and recommendations. With me are my wonderful co-hosts, Sam Cole and Ellie Escobar. Hello. Hi. Well, good to see both of you again. It's nice to see that uh, we survived the poor vortex, and uh, that's a good thing. It's, it was amazing. We survived the polar vortex and we also survived the Chinese spy ball. So it's been a very dramatic week. I wore been. a huge sombrero on my hat outside so their surveillance couldn't detect it, that it was me. They couldn't see my head. <laughs> Excellent. So I want to just see how both of you have been doing. Any uh, exciting news you want to share this week? I uh, personally, it's been kind of a quiet week for me. I've just been um, editing um, the latest video in my YouTube series called Walks of World. And uh, in this video, I actually drive from all the way from Los Angeles to the Arctic Ocean uh, via the Dempster Highway. And that's like a kind of an epic series that I've been doing. So it's Walks of World on YouTube. And my handle is Walks of World 1981. And uh, that's pretty much what I've been up to. Check it out if you get the chance. Shameless plug, but that has honestly been my week. An uneventful week. Other than that, not much excitement. <laughs> Sam, I've, I've seen some of those those uh, episodes. They're fantastic, and uh, I really enjoy uh, seeing your updates from those. That was uh, inspiring, seeing uh, where you've been. I'm glad you enjoyed, and you actually uh, inspired me when you, you shared some like nature videos and stuff. That sort of like gave me the idea, so... Always like hiking, traveling, that type of stuff. Excellent. Ellie, how are you doing this week? Sam has a very exciting life. It's true. It's pretty It's pretty incredible. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. No, sometimes. <laughs> not all the time. Um. So I haven't, uh, well, this week it was just pretty much, uh, I went hard on my training, acting training. So just studying a lot and uh, coaching with my amazing Larry Moss, uh, actor, coach, coach. <laughs> um, and so just been really digging uh, and learning my script for the class and just, you know, prepping, learning, seeing, you know, uh, studying, uh, breaking down the scenes, basically. Um, and so basically it's been a, a preparation week. Um, and every week that I'm not auditioning or in a film, you'll find me here at home, uh, reading plays. Pretending I'm all five characters in the play. Yeah, I do that out loud too. Excellent. That's impressive. Your discipline and commitment to the craft is amazing. Uh, yeah, I love it. You know, it's like, it's something that I just, I, it's, it's not, uh, dudes, I can just be in my kitchen cooking and I start creating my own story in my head. Right. And, and I start acting it too. Sometimes my mom is like, what are you doing? I'm like you, you act like you're crazy. I'm like I am, delusional. <laughs> you have to be delusional to be an actor. That's true. Yeah, cross into an into a better threshold for sure. In a good way, though. In a good in way. In a good way. In a good way. Yeah. <laughs> but you're but you're you're crazy in a good way. Inspirational crazy, <laughs> not like drive a truck into an ATM crazy. You know, that's not you. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. No. Although that'd make a good movie, though. Well, anyone that would that would make a good movie. You is like a maniac driver, and it would be a sequel to that Russell Crowe movie, Unhinged. Except it would star you. <laughs> Dude, and you drive around, you're like, get out of my way! Apologize to me. <laughs> ah! I would watch that movie. Yeah, I think. I, hey, write it. Sam. I will. I will. I'll, I'll have it ready for next week as soon as I watch everything everywhere all at once, which I still haven't yet. And I apologize, but it will happen in the early days. Shame of this podcast. Shame, Sam. Shame. It's shameful. Shame. I'm not proud of it. Yeah. I know it's going to be great. Yeah. On, uh, I guess on a, since we're kind of talking about our <laughs> creative endeavors, um, this I wouldn't necessarily call this uh, creative, but 
uh, another shameless plug. I it was mentioned last week. I, I I did make a feature film, and it's it is streaming. Not you know what? It's not streaming. It's available on video on demand on Vimeo. My, my film Higher Methods. But what I did do, I I, I take little steps, and and um, making progress on it. And I recorded my director's commentary track on it over the week, the oh, past cool. week, Very nice. which it's the first time I've ever done director's commentary uh, for any feature or short, I think ever. That's cool. It was a unique experience. And I did it only by myself because I don't think I was gonna get any of my actors or anybody to come back. And I've been living with this film for now six years or, or more. And I just decided I'm gonna knock this out. So I uh, synced it up to the film and I am making it as um, a bonus feature on the VOD site. So oh, cool. anybody that's that, nice. if anybody purchases it, you get my commentary track and I talk about all the fun we were having on set while we were uh, making the movie on these, um, during the different scenes and I talk about editing choices, music choices, and directing choices for this. It was a, a lot of fun doing that. So it was a, a nice way of kind of revisiting that movie over the past week. So that's a higher methods that's available on VOD on Vimeo on demand. And so do you just, you sync it up to the movie and then you just sit in one sitting, you basically watch the movie. Kind of like what I'm doing right here, right now with both of you <laughs> looking at my laptop and I'm like, all right, so hi, this is Nathan Schur, the director of Higher Methods. And yeah, this was day five and where, and I remember, you know, so yeah, it was, it was kind of like that. It was, I made some notes as I'm going to talk about this uh, during this scene and right and how I could have done this better. I, I didn't do on the negative. But it was uh, it was a nice experience doing that, and I remembered a lot of things that I forgot during the process. So it was um, I might actually record some more commentary tracks if I get uh, my writer Lenny Schwartz to come back. Uh, he he would do it in a heartbeat too. I don't think he he needs his own commentary track probably. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I it was a lot of fun to do, and that's gonna be something that's available uh, soon as a bonus feature for people that purchase it. So we'll see. And uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to move on. Uh, this is not, this is not going to be my shameless plug segment, but I just want to say, that's what I did this past week. It was enjoyable to go back to that film. That sounds like fun. Cool. cool. Yeah. yeah. Good times. So yeah, um, let's move on to a little bit of uh, what we've been um Watching this week, uh, I had a busy week of uh, watching some films and TV. But you know, I'm going to pass the buck first of all because I think uh, Ellie, you've you've been watching some things that we've both seen, and I'll, I'm going to hand it off to you. Um, tell tell me some hey. things that yeah yeah you go first. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, uh, in between my uh, breaks of studying and cooking and cleaning and working my full time job and going to the supermarket, I sat down to watch uh, actually. Uh, few uh things uh i actually watched as i'm gonna probably say it wrong but causeway oh Causeway. so what is that i don't i don't know what that is so jennifer lopez is the lead actor actor in the movie and uh joshua buckley is in there too um and it's about this is the story is about so basically she's a an army soldier uh, who's come home from Afghanistan and her her truck was bombed so she's in, recu in recuperation and it's the story of how she has to get back to the life that she knew and um, it's like a drama it's just you know it's just her, her struggle of getting back to her daily life you know um, it was filmed from 2022 uh, for lack of not finding another film that I really want to see, I decided to watch it. And I actually liked it. I wasn't like, you know, like, a, oh, my God, what a great film. I love Jennifer. Right. I think she's one of my favorite actresses. So I anything she does, I'm going to love. And, and she's so amazing. She's such an amazing um, actress that makes you feel every moment that she's going through. And I felt every moment of her um, heartbreak of 
being who she is now and uh, trying to get over her whole family history because her mom is not, you know, she drinks alcohol and, you know, her brother is in jail and he's a mute, the brother. Um, oh, wow, okay. I wasn't quite, I didn't quite understand the story between the brother and the, and the sister. Uh, there's a moment in the film uh, that she comes to visit him in jail and everything, the whole period is done in sign language. And I don't know sign language. So I didn't quite understand what was going on. But what was great about that moment is that you probably don't need to understand too much sign language because the emotions that they portray tells you so much about it, about what they're maybe talking about. You know? Right, you can feel the emotion through the character and the way they're like exactly. So yeah. Even though I don't know a sign language, then their facial expressions, the the movements of their bodies, all of that, you know, brought me in. And I'm like, oh my god, it's such a vulnerable and lo lovely moment between brother and sister, you know. And so, um, it's just a good feel movie, you know nothing big but it's an independent film i think and i think this is um the director Le lila and i can't say her last name nuper something like that and she's it's her de her directorial debut film i believe oh wow okay nugba nugbauer N yeah i think nugbauer i guess yeah there you go and it's um it's yeah so i i I'm not gonna say it's like up there with the big films that I've seen this past year, but it's definitely I I has it been nominated? I think it's been nominated for the Oscar too. I'm, was it? I don't know. I'm not I, sure. I I feel like it was one of the nominations. Yes, best performance by an actor in a supporting role, Brian Tyree Henry. Yes, he's oh my god, he's awesome. I really liked him. Well, you know, this is on my list now because I haven't yeah, seen this yet yeah. and I am trying to catch up on as many movies yeah. that were nominated. So, yeah. I really know there is this. It's, it's, it's a normal story of people that you, you could go through that, you know, and it's the story of this veteran and soldier, you know. It's, she, she's trying to, the fun part, the, the, the thing is she, she hates it where she's at so much that she wants to, she starts to exercise and work out because she wants to be redeploy right and like she doesn't understand that like you can't go back you're not well you know but uh yeah i really loved it and so i also i also watched um <laughs> the pamela anderson documentary i know <laughs> i know what, what more does society have to learn about Pam Anderson? I, I uh, please. Okay, me... Good contrast between the two films. Listen, there. Yeah. listen. I, maybe because I'm a mom and she has two sons, and I have a son, I connected to the documentary. I'm, but I did. What what, what, I, what is it called? Um, uh, I think it's Pamela Anderson. No. No. Okay. Is it Pamela Anderson? It's is it Pam and Tommy? No, that's the, that's Pam and Tommy is it's so funny. Pam and Tommy <laughs> is the Hulu series. Oh, okay. And oh, I'm, gotcha, gotcha. I do not want to watch those. I I would not watch this. <laughs> I don't want to watch. You it. didn't. You sure you didn't watch Barb Wire? <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, God. oh wow, Barb Wire. I never saw the film, but I saw the trailer for it. That was like 1995, wasn't it? Dude, uh, I never around saw there. Barb Wire, man. Damn, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. No. I remember that vividly. Next yeah. week on Back to the Frame Rate, we're reviewing Barbed Wire. Barbed Wire. <laughs> Anyways, sorry, I didn't mean to to, to no, go so, off on a so tangent. You, yes, you guys Anderson. are funny, but here's the thing: I know you guys were. I knew you guys were gonna like. <laughs> exactly, I knew you were gonna, gonna react this way. But here's the thing: hear me out, okay? I, I, there's a part in the documentary. I actually got teary eyed. I did. I like, you know, crying. And I'm thinking like, why am I crying? It's Pamela Anderson. But I think it's, um, there's so much pain that we don't know a person's life, right? Until we know a person's life. We know about a person's life because the magazines tells us 
right they are because the you know the paparazzi the you know the tabloids but we don't really know what a person is going through behind all of the all of that you know and her story is is really one of those like how she grew up how she was abused she seemed very naive you know she's canadian not that the canadians are naive because i'm a naive person myself but um i can connect in how she can be so naive about life and about people that she would trust anyone and I have been in that situation where I trust everybody and I'm naive about people. Um, but what I love most about the documentary is that she, you know, she she was given a part in Chicago, the the play. And oh, she right, went yeah. to Broadway and she and, and she did a great job, you know? And it's like one of those like endings were oh my god you're rooting for her that she does well in the play and she did you know it sounds like it's an insightful documentary too that tries to like get to know her and really go into who she is as opposed to like what you were saying before all the periphery of the media stuff you know yeah yeah and she she's um you know she's she left her career what i love about it is that she as a mom decided to give um, her life and her her attention to both her boys and I don't think there's anything more rewarding than you giving up what you love or your life uh, for to to raise your kids you know and you see Pamela with no makeup her hair not done you know um, just really raw and, and and she's a beautiful woman but you, you could you know it's uh we make you we pass judgment on people and we don't really know their stories. And I really love documentaries like this because um, you know, whether people like her or don't approve of what she does, and <laughs> the poor woman's been looking for love everywhere and get gotten married so many times, you know. And she even says in, in the documentary, um, maybe I'll I'll get married again. <laughs> And and her kids, what one of her sons says, yeah, she's a hopeless romantic, you know. She she'll she'll probably get married again before she's 80 years old, you know. So um, but yeah, so it's very um for me, it was um I loved her story, um watching it from the mom's point of view. You know? Um, yeah, that perspective for sure. I hear that. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed it. And then the last thing I saw. Um, and I want to say also that's um, called Pamela Anderson, a love story. And that's yes. on Netflix. Yes. Yeah. And, and her whole documentary is based on all the journals that she wrote since she was young, basically. And, and she wrote a book too. So um, uh, kudos to her, you know, kudos to her for coming out of uh, such a turmoil life that she had um and raising her kids to be good kids you know they're good kids um and that's all you want as a mom to raise um, kids that are amazing and uh, kind uh and the last thing i saw was um it's a series on apple tv it's called shrinking Mm -hmm. i saw this too oh my god you guys if you have not seen okay sam if you have not seen it see it okay did you see? I haven't seen it. Ted Lasso. Did anyone see Ted Lasso? Yes. Same creators of Ted Lasso. Yes. And I love it because I love Ted Lasso. And if the same creators come out and they do shrinking. And I love it. I love Harrison Ford in this show. Well, we're going to differ on that because... Um... Of course I think we Harrison, are. I, I think Harrison... I, I, I love Harrison Ford. But I'm finding Harrison Ford just, he is sleepwalking through this role. And this has me actually kind of worried for Indiana Jones. And I know he's probably going to bring the goods uh, in that movie. At least I'm hoping he does. But I don't know what Harrison Ford is doing. I feel like he just rolled out of bed um, onto the set. And he could not, he, this is the most curmudgeon curmudgeon version of Harrison Ford I have seen and okay. he's already like that guy. And it's like, yeah. I'm not I can tell and, that, and, that. And it's like, Ellie... oh my God, just, and, and they wrote, they wrote this role for him. Like, 
can you can you be like this grumpy guy that just hates life and like <laughs> like yeah like hold my beer i mean it's 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 oh like i i it's 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 giving me like a little migraine right here just thinking about what he's bringing to this role and it's not a major part of the show no. but he it's, it's just enough where it's it's I am debating whether I'm going to stick with it. I've watched, I think there have been three episodes aired so far. I, I didn't mean to interrupt Wait, you, Ellie. No, but, but you think you think he's fragile in this show? And by the way, as when you said um, that you thought that he was phoning in his performance. Um, oh, my God. Uh, people listening to this podcast can't see this, but um, Ellie was in such strong disagreement with you that she spit out her water. She was shocked <laughs> by her comments. So clearly yes. she, she thinks Harrison Ford's. Oh my, how dare you! I have Harrison. not seen it. I cannot comment. I'm a Harrison Ford fan, but but I I cannot add a perspective because I don't he, have one yet. Doesn't hey. even come. There's not. He doesn't even come close to a smile in the first three episodes. Not that he's supposed to, because that is the character. He is. Yeah. This is the this is the man that has got baggage, and we're learning. I'm sure by the end of this season, we're going to learn a lot more about his character and why he is the way he is. But right now. I do not want to spend another scene with his character. Uh, I I I love Harrison, uh, and I you know he's playing the part that he's been given, and I think that he's doing a great job because of his age. Like I, I see what you're saying. I do see what you're saying, Nathan. I am not gonna agree with you right out. I'm not gonna agree with you, uh, Jason Segel. I love him too. He's funny as heck. Okay. He's, he, he, Jason Siegel's doing good work. He's doing the work that you've seen a dozen other times before. He plays the sad sack puppy dog like you've seen him in half a dozen other movies, but he's so good at that. Yes, he is. He is very good at that. He is cast great in this. He is. Uh, in the show. And I like him. I've always liked Jason Siegel. You know, I like, he takes some chances in some films I really appreciate. Um, but I'm not seeing anything from the show that is like, oh, I'm seeing, I see, I see them trying to recapture this, uh, a similar formula of Ted Lasso. And there are a lot of themes that are crossing over. Yeah, I, I do agree on that. And I think Ted Lasso is so unique. He, mm. I mean, Ted Lasso, Ted Lasso, that show is just up there for me, you know? So I'm still finding my way around shrinking. So I think it's only been three episodes yeah. um, so far and I've enjoyed them. You know, I mean, I'm not going to compare them to Ted because I don't think they're at that level, but I like it. Just like it. We'll see. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, Sam, you got uh, something you want to tell us about from this week that you've seen? Um, I, I will. Yeah. I, so uh, because I've been editing a lot this week and sort of been like a slave to my computer a little bit, I've managed to get to HBO during the wee hours. Um, and the reason for that is when you're, you know, making like YouTube content, in my case, it's like a travel, you know, hiking adventure show. It's a good idea to film a whole bunch of content before because it's supposed to come out every Friday. So you, it's so it's been catching up to me where, where I am in the footage the um, has been, on. has been like, you know, I have, I have to release it each week. And so it's been catching up to me a little bit. Um, I didn't realize what a train it was going to be. And so I've been watching HBO at like two o'clock in the morning. And uh, I actually watched a favorite of mine. I bumped into it the other night, master and commander, the far side of the world, the Peter Weir film about the HMS um, surprise with lucky captain, Jack Audrey. Aubrey, excuse me, played by Russell Crowe. Um, and that movie came out just about 20 years ago, um, November 2003. And over the years, it's grown on me every year. Every time I see that movie, I like it more and more and notice more detail. And I think Peter Weir is an incredible director. Um, and I would maybe put that film in my top 20 films. I mean, I just love it. So that's all I've seen this week. Shows, anything like that? But Bastard Commander's yeah. a great film. Peter Weir, amazing director that needs to get out of director's jail. And I don't know why he is. I don't know why. Do you, I don't know if there's any. What, what source... happened with, I don't, I don't know. I don't, what's know. What, yeah. um, I don't know. He did um, a move. I don't actually, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I just hear rumors that he's just 
is in director's jail really you mean like you mean like in trouble or just uh, no like- i don't really know no, like he didn't get in trouble but like uh, i don't i don't think mass i i really don't really know what happened but i think he should be working like crazy and yeah i don't understand what happened i don't think he's that old so i don't know if he just kind of decided to leave the industry he's in his mid-70s i believe but um, the last movie I saw of his, and I, oh, I think it was, I can't remember the title, but I think it, was it is like, Master and Commander is the last thing that. No, there was a 2010 film that he did with these prisoners escape like through Siberia. I think it's The Way Out or something like that. That was uh, the, decent. The Way Back with Colin Farrell, Ed Harris. The Way Back. Yes, that's it. Ronan, and it was yeah, good. I never but saw it. It wasn't quite as focused as Master and Commander is one of those movies where you get to enjoy like attention to detail. And like the Navy war tactics, the naval war yes. tactics, and, and just it's just so well crafted. The sound design is amazing. It's just a pleasure to watch that movie. So that's what I've seen this week. Other than that, just just editing and working, basically. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I will. I think I'm starting to see the type of movies you like, Sam. Yeah. Sorry. I'm starting to see what kind of movies you like now. Yes, I uh, mm-hmm. epic. Yeah, just like large scale, you know, ensemble cast. Yeah. Love those movies. So I've, I, I had a, a very busy week of watching some things and I'm not even going to mention everything because I don't think we have enough time for it. Um, might save uh, some of those stories for next week, but it, I, I'm going to start off with um, a conversation. Listeners of the show uh, don't know this, but we, after last week's show, we had a conversation after our, are recording like what are we going to watch this week and one of the things that came up with and we ended up shooting it down probably shouldn't have was the the um i think it's a netflix comedy called you people and we passed it we were going back and forth on um on messenger like should we watch this and i said no it's gonna be like this stupid like mm-hmm. look who's guess who's coming to dinner woke movie and it's gonna be awful mm-hmm. and I decided, yep. all right, the heck with it. I'm going to watch this anyways. And I thought it was really funny. Ah. I actually was impressed. Surprise. I know, Ellie, you could, you could make fun of me now. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> I know. This, um, this is a new feature from uh, Kenya Barris, who is known mostly from his television work as the creator of Blackish, Grownish, Mixedish, all the ishes. Uh, he, uh, he wrote Girls Trip a few years ago, which actually is, I kind of liked it, uh, I remember. But he also did the sequel to Coming to America, Coming to America, which I think is a crime against cinema. I really did not like that film. I haven't seen the second film. Oh Obviously, my God. The first it, movie, classic. Like, it, it, it is, but the, the I have se- not seen the second. Yeah. The sequel, I, I, there's so much I hate about that movie. Well, it's like uh, I didn't see it too. Ellie, Ellie, <laughs> you saw this, right? I, no, I, I didn't see Coming to America. Too. No, uh, you people. Oh, my goodness. You people. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so on the surface, I think this you, you, this appears to be like a conventional rom-com, but I think this movie has something more to say. It's it's kind of disguised as this guest who's coming to dinner-esque retread, mm-hmm. but it's, you know, it's about the story of this couple. And they're played by Jonah Hill and Lauren London who fall in love. And before they can get married, of course, they have to meet the parents. This, of course, uh, you know, it's not covering new territory. You know, we've seen this in movies like Meet the Parents. You know, however, the, the scenes where they meet uh, Jonah's um, parents, uh, I think it's uh, Jonah's, his name is Ezra, and his family is Jewish in the film, which is a major plot point. Now, I'm, I'm Jewish, though. A lot of the humor that's thrown around, uh, I thought was really hysterical. His mom, um, played by Julie Louise Dreyfus, I thought she was hysterical and the uh the some of the things that comes out of her mouth they're extremely offensive but the, i know people in my family and people in the jewish community that have, that behave just like her so this um they they did a really good job you know kind of encapsulating some of the uh stereotypes of uh i guess I, I don't know if this is offensive but some of the stereotypes of the people that i i have met from uh <laughs> families that i've known <laughs> in a, in my, my family i should say maybe but anyways uh i, dig, I digress um but it's perfect casting 
Um, so she's overjoyed that her son is dating a black woman, you know, possibly unwittingly sees the, this opportunity to show her off uh, to her high society friends as being this, as being woke and progressive. But his dad is played by David Duchovny, who doesn't, he doesn't say anything, but I think he steals like every scene he's in. He doesn't, it's, it's, it's also great casting. Um, and I haven't even begun to mention Eddie Murphy yet. He, and he has one of the best introductions uh, of, of any film I've seen in years. When he strolls into the room wearing <laughs> this Fred Hampton was murdered sweatshirt. <laughs> and his character Akbar, uh, and they're a family of Muslims. And he looks like, um, he looks just like Malcolm X in the movie. Yes. With the goatee, the, the beard. And Eddie is so restrained in this film. Uh, you're not getting the slapstick, silliness, goofy Eddie Murphy. He's a real fleshed out character. He's not, you know, doing any Norbert character or anything like that. I really loved Eddie Murphy in this movie. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, this film is it's just really funny. There's great one-liners in this. Um, you know, I did watch this alone, and I found myself laughing out loud. Uh, quite often, which is very rare for me. And at its heart, you know, it's not, it's more than just a conventional rom-com. Um, it does fall into a lot of the pitfalls that rom-coms do in the third act, I thought. Um, but I think this film does have a strong thesis and at its core, you know, it's, it's really about, it's hard for black people and white people to be friends is really what it's trying to say. And I like that it's bringing up this dialogue and, ex and trying to explore that in this film. So it's it's much better than I ever thought this film could be. I mean, it's it's funny because what I love about the film is that it it shows you know the reality of when you have interracial interracial um, relationships with someone and how the family you know or, you know feels about it. Um, like for example, in my family, you know, we, we being Latinas. And my, my brother married a, a, a girl from uh, uh, what's it called? Not not from Linfield, which is a predominantly white, you know, community. Uh, and <laughs> my bro when my brother moved in with her, um, she's half Irish and Italian, um, and he was outside mowing the lawn, and his neighbor, and she was born in Linfield. Um, her neighbor comes out and says, "Hey, where did you get the landscaper? I could I could use a landscaper. What's his name?" Yep. <laughs> and my, and my my sister in law says, "Oh, I'm sorry, that's my my boyfriend." And the dentist was so like, "I am so sorry, I didn't know. Oh, I thought he was your life. So you see how like the stereotypes and. You know, uh, and, and it's a lot, you have to adapt. You have to adapt to the family, you know, and the family, vice versa, has to adapt to the new person. So, yep. Um, and I'll say one other thing that I've watched this week as I uh, want to move along is I've been watching Poker Face, which is a new Peacock show, um, which is stars Natasha Leon on, and this is uh, created by Ryan Johnson which is this i'm hooked on this show this is uh fantastic it's um basically if you like shows like columbo mm. or murder she wrote it's a throwback to 70s 80s style kind of murder mysteries where oh, cool. the crime like the crime is shown to you who died who did it and Natasha Leon or Lion Leon is basically a drifter who kind of stumbles into the scene. And her superpower is basically that she can tell um, whenever anybody is lying. She just knows she has like a sixth sense. So she can always, uh, so basically she solves mysteries this way. And it's, that's what I love about it. It's and it's not a serial. It is just kind of like episodic, where it's like a, the mystery of the week, which is a nice breath of fresh air. I feel like you know we're in this era of serialized TV, 
where you need to like always tune in every single episode. It appears that this is going to be a show that's a throwback to like Columbo style shows where you can just kind of like tune in and see, you know, what is this, what is the the murder that she's solving this week? I think there's going to be a, a slight through line to the sit the show, but um, this is really, really good stuff. And Ryan Johnson uh, wrote and directed the first the first episode, but he created the show and it's really, really good. And it looks like it's going to have awesome guest stars. Like Adrian Brody was in the first episode. Um, John Ratzenberger actually has a small role in the second episode. Um, It's fantastic. And right now it's streaming on Peacock. I'm going to have to check that out. It is. It's fantastic. No, I love anything detective and murder. Like I I, I watch discovery channel every single day. Um, and that actually reminds me, I started watching on Apple TV, The Truth, Truth, Truth Be Told, um, Octavia, uh, what's her name? The Octavia Spencer? Octavia Spencer. Yeah. I, and by the third episode, I just couldn't continue it. Mm. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't get through it. I don't know. And I really love shows like this, but I don't know. Has, has I, it- highly, I highly recommend this one. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to check that one out. All right. Well, that's what we have all been watching over the last week. Let's move on to our main review. That's me. How does it feel to win such a life-changing sum of money? Oh, well, I feel like a lot better than yesterday. <laughs> what do you plan to do with 190,000 smackaroos? I don't know. Maybe buy a house? Buy something nice for my boy, you know, just have a better life. Save my soul, ran through the night, <laughs> lost in the woods. And I won't be a good mama again. She just blew all that money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where's she been? I won the lottery. I was the one who won the lottery. Look out for yourself. You always do. Make them derelicts you spit on. We ain't partying no more. Chasing the pavement. Things don't go the same way for any two people, and I don't think any less of you for having the problems you do. Been down this road, not you know what? It's my life. I might look stupid to you. You don't. Yeah, well, I ain't one for letting people get over on me. Hey, hey! I'm not gonna do this again. <laughs> Town tries to avoid me like the plague, and my boy doesn't want to see me. He ain't never gonna speak to me again. Try to be good, yeah, try to be real. Y'all remember Leslie, don't you? Helen and Raymond's little girl. But you don't gotta worry about me because despite your best effort, I ain't going nowhere. Angels are falling down on me. Good Christian people raised you right. You ruined that sweet boy's life. And what did you do to stop me? So don't walk away, you can count. Tell me I'm good. Now, um, little, we're going to pull the curtain aside here. We had, we were all, like I said before, after our recording last week, we were trying to figure out what we we're going to watch. And uh, <laughs> at one time, we thought we were gonna, all going to watch You People. We, we actually were going to try to watch uh, Knock at the Cabin. Now all of us could get to the theater this past week. So there appeared to be a little miscommunication about what we were all going to watch. And I proposed we watch uh, to Leslie. But apparently, Ellie didn't understand the assignment the assignment i guess we should say which it's not a big deal because i don't think she would have wanted to see it anyways it sounds like it was not her jam Mm -hmm. when she found when when um she saw the trailer for this originally so she is going to abstain from this conversation i guess and me and sam are going to talk about this briefly um, but that's okay. That's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. It's only our second actually, episode. Nathan, we're learning. Nathan, I truly thought you were talking about a Leslie person, not the Leslie movie. Yes. My, my good friend, Leslie. Yeah. 
So let's hear what you said. you guys think about it. Because I was not sold on this. But I, did, I saw the trailer and I'm like, nope. Not buying it. <laughs> I thought it was well done. I thought um, Andrea Riseborough, who played Leslie, was like did a really good job. It's 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 a kind of a slow moving character study drama. Not necessarily a film that I would be strongly drawn to on my own. But after seeing it, I solidly enjoyed it. I don't feel strongly passionate about it, but I thought it was a good film, well acted. Um, my favorite aspect of it probably was Alice and Jenny is like an angry, you know, I thought she was really good in it, but, um, yeah, that's, that's, I not, uh, that's it. I, I can understand. Yeah. Why you were not hugely excited about the film. <laughs> Okay, neither is yeah. anymore. It was, it was good. I enjoyed it. I watched it. I, I would have rather watched Master and Commander again or played <laughs> video games, but you know, it's I watched it. <laughs> yeah, I watched the notebook. But it wasn't bad. I did I did enjoy it. I just uh, yeah. Uh I, I when I saw this, um there's there's a there's a lot of it I did like. I think I like this the way that this movie was paced in a lot of ways. There the opening it showed the movie like how she won the the money in the beginning. And I you know, I think we should probably should give a little bit of background on, on yeah. this film. So the basically this movie is I forget the what's what's uh her name in this, but there's a mom. She's a single mom, and I like how that it never really explains about uh, her name is uh, the title of the movie, Leslie. Right? Oh my yeah. God! Yes, this is you know it's it's ten o'clock at night. The passion. Shut up, the Sam. Passion all right. This film. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, leave me alone. Okay. All right. Okay. Anyway, so Please. Leslie, okay. <laughs> Leslie, um, six years ago wins one hundred and ninety thousand dollars at in the lottery. Which is kind of interesting because you know that's a lot of money, but it's not like some grand jackpot either. But for somebody living, I guess this is Texas, I think it is. Yes, Texas. It's not, yeah. but this is huge money for her, obviously. This, this is going to set her up, could set her up for a long time. And the beginning of the movie is shown in like video footage, like TV footage of her. And she is ecstatic that she won this and she is going to buy herself a new life. I love how this starts with this uh, triumphant moment and then it thrusts you forward six years later and she is, I think she's at a bar immediately or in bed, but she she is already rock bottom at this point. Her son, as who I think is like 18 or 19 years old, has left her. She has basically alienated everybody in her life. She has nothing left and it thrusts you into the present and so that the, all of that cel celebratory moment it's just r ripped away from her and us the audience immediately and uh it's a very jarring cut she is on the hunt she's looking for a hookup and really just looking for a handout i think more than anything so she is really sad and depressed and trying starts to reconnect with tried to reconnect with her son, who I think is like I said, 18 or 19, finds him, moves in with him, and he is laying down house rules that she it seems to be wanting to be on her best behavior. But it's clear that the moment that he leaves to go off to work, she is going to start boozing again, and she cannot keep her promise of being uh, sober like he wants her to be. Because apparently one of the reasons why everything fall, fell apart in her life is that she just drank all the money away. So this is a story of somebody that um, when they won the money, they just didn't know how to handle um, their life. And um, I think the movie did do a good job at showing the brutal reality of her day-to-day mm. -day lifestyle, like one day at a time, not knowing where she was going to sleep sleeping in that like abandoned ice cream shop i just it yeah was, it was just um it was it was good it was well done and like i enjoyed the the movie like it like again the 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 style of the film is not necessarily my particular genre i tend to go towards like suspense and like sci-fi and action that's just me as a person but i did i did enjoy it um 
I thought it was well done. I did not feel extremely passionate about it, but I will say a spoiler free comment that I was involved enough and I liked the characters enough that there was a very strong emotional payoff at the end. That's all I'll say that I found like, you know, it was like, got me sort of tearful. So it was good. It was well you, done. It just, you, yeah. you mentioned Allison Janney, who is always fantastic. She's amazing. Uh, and, and Incredible. Amazing. I love her in the West Wing, one of my favorite mm -hmm. shows. Yeah. And she is, I don't know if, um, is it her husband or partner? Stephen Root is in this and playing. Is that, I don't know if that's supposed to be um, Leslie's dad or not. He is a brutal man. Yeah, in this, which is un yeah. which is unusual, uh, unusual casting for him, but um, but Allison, uh, her mom, is uh, is, is wonderful, wonderful in this, and I and I didn't know if that was at first. I didn't know if I liked her in this, and but it does come full circle in a in a has a good payoff. It comes full circle has a really good payoff, and I I liked her a lot because it was so different from the types of characters that I see Alice and Jenny play, even though she plays a lots of different types of characters, mm -hmm. she just seemed, she had moments of such like vicious anger in this film that I hadn't particularly seen from her before and the things that I'd seen. So I just, I, I liked, I thought her, I, the fact that she was in the movie made me like it a lot more. Mm -hmm. And another, another uh, standout. Mark Maron I, was good. Yeah. Mark Maron. Oh my God. The hotel manager. Um, he was incredible. I remember he was in uh, the show Glow as well. I don't know if you saw Glow, but didn't see that. Oh. He was he his character had so much empathy. He is trying to help Leslie at a, uh, a major point in this movie, and he has so much patience for her in this. And I'm not going to give too much away, but I'm just I'm watching him, and he. His the, the the level of patience and empathy that he has and and he's such a wonderful actor. I I really love the work he was putting in this. And he did not get a best supporting uh nomination. And he would have been the actor that I would have appreciated seeing get a nomination more than oh, for sure, yeah. because he does some incredible work in this. Um, and it's painful watching Mark's character as he's assisting uh, Leslie in this because uh, he, you think that he is going to get um, worked over completely <laughs> in this. Oh film. yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, That's what, what I did like about it—just the realization that I mean that that no one could basically rely on her given her situation and like her alcoholism, and it was just very like that was powerful because it was well done and not sensationalized yeah there was a scene that really uh, stood out for me um again not really giving anything away but she hits a point where the it's so low she she goes back to her her old home her original home i guess where a new family walks in where, where a new family's living she walks in and you can tell because she first goes outside and there's um a um is a tree where she's carved in the words uh leslie i think it was maybe her son's name was on or yeah. something like that and a heartbreaking scene where she just walked around and the, again people have so much patience for her um the woman that's living in this home lets her walk in and just kind of like walk around it's like is there somebody i can call for you it's you know i feel like maybe this is some sort of texas hospitality that I was unaware of, but it's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. The leeway that she gets and um, what she gets away with <laughs> on this, yeah. that she was able to walk right in. But it's, I, I had this pit in my stomach as I'm watching this, that this is not going to end well. Um, and um, it was, it was, it was a tough watch. It was a tough watch at time thinking like where this was going to go. But um. Yeah, like I, I solidly enjoyed it. I don't think it reinvented any wheel. Like, I, I mean, I've seen movies like that before. So I would say like solid, like B plus, like I, I solidly enjoyed it. Um, but I don't feel strongly about the movie, if that makes sense. No, it, it does get into some convent, you know, without giving anything away at the end. Um, I feel that Leslie's 
uh, third act does kind of get into a a bit of a conventional third act in some yeah, ways. There's a little bit of that like Deus Ex Machina kind of little, like little little bit of a bow tie. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I I definitely felt that. It felt like two acts of pure brutal realism, and a third act that I enjoyed and I like. You know, but there happy is, endings. But there, it was like bow tie. Yeah. But it's not fully a bow tie because I think that no matter what, you know, she has alcoholism is a real disease and she is never going to be out of the woods. Right. And I think that even up until the last minute, there is a moment where she has a choice to do, to, to do something. And she doesn't, and which could have definitely affected, um, an interaction that happens in the end, which, um, which, um, was a key moment for, how the how the how the final scene goes. It's difficult to talk about this without spoiling it, but it's it's um it's you can see that she easily could have made the wrong decision right before right. um she's some some people, and the next time that happens, she could easily take the bottle, and something terrible is going to happen. So this is not necessarily a happy ending yeah she could always this relapse film, and, and for like, this film yeah. yes but tomorrow next week um i could easily see her this whole um project that she is going into could easily fall apart but i think the people that are around her are she found potentially um a network yeah she did like and, a she's got like a good like safety network of people and also like i it wasn't i don't think it was too much of a bow tie ending like it wasn't too sentimental it was realistic i was aware of the mechanisms of the third act but because i enjoyed the characters and had been with her on the journey i was happy to see you know the the, the positive things that were beginning to happen in her life like it, it was a an optimistic ending a hopeful ending yeah which is good not everything is solved, but there's, you know, this tomorrow's another day. That's always a good message. Yep. As opposed to a film that's like, life sucks. Like, <laughs> you'll be charged a lot for everything. Like, pay your taxes, go to sleep, and wake up and keep your head down, you bastard, you know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's our thoughts on Two Leslie. It sounds like this was probably not your favorite kind of movie. It ne- wasn't necessarily mine either. And maybe uh, uh, we'll, we'll find something with uh, a little bit more meat on the bone um, for next week. And, and maybe uh, Ellie will get the, the, the memo <laughs> next week and we'll have a, a more of a three-way conversation. <laughs> I'm getting an eight but- class next week. What are you talking about? Next okay. next week, Nathan will choose, dude, where's my car? And then, El- oh, and then yes. Ellie will be like, I thought you were asking me where your car was. You wanted us to watch that? Oh, I just, I thought you didn't know where your car I, was. I am so literal. I will like, the way you say it, it's the way I'm going to take it. I, I totally I'm, I'm just going to send you um, a JPEG of the movie poster. Like, watch this. No, no. <laughs> Seriously, though, Nathan, that's exactly what you have to do. Because you'll be like... Um, no, this is. I'm gonna send you a link of the movie. But the scary and, thing and is like, and buy you your ticket to the screening if I have to. <laughs> Be here I, now. I feel you, um, Ellie. I feel you because we both know that behind the scenes, like Nathan is a real tyrant. He's like, you guys are gonna do this podcast right. well, or I'm gonna like oh, set right. your house on fire. I'm like, whatever you want. The exactly. so audience sorry. has no idea. Yeah. It's a horror film altogether. It is. It really is. But we survive one day at a time. Uh, with hope in our hearts. Yes, with hope in our hearts. <laughs> um all right. Let's let's move on. You know what? You know, before we get to our uh, news story of the week, I just, you know, I was looking at some a couple of film film versaries. Um did you know that over the past week it was the 35th anniversary of the Wonder Years premiering on ABC. That's amazing. And anybody, what a great show that was. I loved that show when I was growing up. And yeah. that in, in, in 1988, when that premiered, um, 
the show took place 20 years prior to that in 1968. So that means that if that show was on now, it would be showing the events of 2003. That's just crazy wow. to me. Because even though 2003 is 20 years ago, it literally is. It's like a the it, the the sixties felt so much more distant in the early eighties. But I was also like a little kid. I do vividly remember though the season finale of Wonder Years or the the finale of the whole show of the whole show in spring of nineteen ninety three. I was in fifth grade and like that was a big deal. Like everyone watched the the final episode and talked about it the next day. Must see television back in the day. And another uh, film versary. Uh, this well, we just had Groundhog Day, and uh, Punxsutawney Phil did did see a shadow, predicting another six weeks of winter. However, he's only been correct thirty nine percent of the time. Oh wow! So you're probably better off with him seeing a shadow, anyways. You're but only thirty nine percent. God, what yeah. an idiot! But so yeah. th- my point is that. Um, on February 14th, Valentine's Day, marks the 30th anniversary of the film Groundhog Day. Oh, wow. That's 30 years. That would, what's his face now? What's his name? Um, Bill Murray. Bill Murray. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> wow. I just can't believe it's 30 years. And That was an I amazing pro- film. I probably watch Groundhog Day almost every year. It's one of the few films I, I never can get enough of. I love that movie. I think it's a classic. I was just reading an article about it on my phone recently. I knew nothing about this. Apparently, Bill Murray and Harold Ramis had like really strong disagreements on that film and their friendship was strained. And uh, it was like a big, like they fought their way through that movie, which is amazing to me because it's an excellent film. You know, you never would have known. I just have a uh, question. According to the article, yeah. Um, it's Groundhog Day only in the states that uh have different seasons or all over the united states i believe I it's, it's just the united states in general yeah. i think yeah uh, yeah yeah because i mean where i come from we don't have groundhog day so i first time i heard groundhog as i had no idea what they were talking about <laughs> <laughs> like brown yeah i think it's just a, a, hog a traditional ground? thing here yeah <laughs> yeah but you're not missing much because, as we've established, Puxatani Phil is not the brightest bulb in the shack. No, no. Even though I'd be friendly, I'd be friendly to to, to Phil if I met him. I'd be like, "Oh, hello, oh, do, 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 do. You know, <laughs> this is a groundhog that feed it some chips or something." Yeah, it's an interesting concept. Uh, groundhog. O- only in America would we. I guess so, because you know. <laughs> I mean, in my country, it's always like, what, 100 degrees? <laughs> so it's like- I think it would be like funny and horrible if he came out one day and they just were like, nope, the tradition is over. And they just like caged it and drove off of it and was like, that's the end of your tradition. Like, who came up with that tradition, though? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Don't I just know. like I just like random shock value humor. Like, I think it would be hilarious, like this is total non sequitur and and I'll just say this quick, but like if you had a movie like the Thor franchise or some huge hero like Indiana Jones or Thor or Wonder Woman, some important character that, that had a death scene that completely denied the audience any like emotional respect or anything. I'm saying like if like Thor is running along and some giant elephant yeah. just like tramples him yeah, and that's it. And the movie just goes on and you're like, what? <laughs> Thor, this beloved character for like eight films, and that's he's just dead. What, like, I have always wanted to see something that just shocks and insults the audience, and it'd be hilarious one time, but that film will never get made because it just wouldn't happen. But it would be funny. I don't actually want it to happen, but I like pretending in my mind. Don't have pizza people around the cinema, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) Yeah. protesting that film. And, or like Indiana Jones, he's just like walking along and he like stubs his toe and just like falls off a like <laughs> he's like in a like a rock quarry and he goes, oh, and he just falls down a canyon. That's it. That's that's the end of Indiana Jones. <laughs> Not even a close up shot. He's like in the background of a wide shot, slips through a hole. And that's like it. a yeah. three or four minute movie. And yeah. Yeah. That's or like funny. finding finding Nemo. It's like 70 percent of finding Nemo like normal that then at the end, the fish just gets like caught up into a boat propeller and it's like <laughs> boop, 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 and, the, and the end credits you just are... roll yeah. <laughs> wow <It's> so horrible <laughs> you are twisted yeah 
Have you had? Your, I truly am twisted. Have you had your dinner yet today? <laughs> I have not. I have not had dinner oh. yet tonight. Yeah, I'm empty <laughs> stomach. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's sure. let's move things along, and that way we can get you some food. <laughs> but yeah. I wish Nemo no harm. I very much yeah. like that fish. Oh. <laughs> All right, let's uh, move on to our next segment, segment the uh, the trades, um, where, where we cover a uh, recent news story going on in the entertainment world. Um, over the last week, at least I found this interesting, and maybe to the chagrin of everybody else here, but James Gunn uh, is resetting the DC Universe. And this came out, uh, this information came out about five days ago, I think January 31st or February 1st, something like that. Um, first of all, does anybody care here? I do. I think it could be, I think it could be great. And I, oh. he's certainly a, a, an amazing visualist with a vision. You know what I mean? So I think he's a great director. I just have no idea what his plans are. I know nothing about it, save for the fact that he got rid of um, Henry Cavill, he got Superman is no longer that, yeah. that actor. Henry Cavill, right? yeah. Henry Cavill has yeah. been uh, reportedly ousted as Superman, but there has been maybe a caveat to that. I'm going to get to that in a moment. But before we get to that, any reflections on the Snyderverse? Now that that is going to be put to bed after the next slew of films, we got the upcoming, uh, we got The Flash, we got Blue Beetle, you got... Um, the Aquaman movie I know you're looking forward to. I think, is there anything else I'm missing in that slate of films? I don't know. And There's then, a lot that we... I don't know of. I like the Aquaman movie so yeah. much just because its tone was lighter. It what felt more that... like a Marvel movie to me, to be quite honest. Is there something Brave and the Bold? Well, yes. So the five, there have been five feature films that have been announced amongst five TV shows as well. Some of them are animated. Some of them are live action because there's so much we could dive into. We don't, I say we don't get fully into like all the TV shows and animated series because we could talk for another hour about that. But let's, let me just go over the five films that have been brought, that have been announced. The, the first of course is Superman, mm -hmm. uh, which you mentioned, I think about a month or so ago because Superman legacy and this already has a release date of July 11th, 2025. And there are speculations that James Gunn actually could direct this himself. We also have The Authority. I know nothing about what The Authority is going to be. We have The Brave and the Bold, which is uh, supposedly going to be Batman's introduction to the DCU. Yep. We got Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, and we have Swamp Thing. So let's just do this quickly one by one. So we have a Superman Legacy. And um, so Henry Cavill will not be Superman is what we do know. Um, and by the way, this whole, this whole franchise that. is being called Gods and Monsters. He's, he's, uh, that's the, what the, he's coining the, um, this uh, first phase one, I guess, if we want to compare it to Marvel. He's calling it gods and monsters. Ellie, what were you about to say? No, I'm saying I'm pretty bummed out that Superman is not going to be my Superman. <laughs> yeah, well, apparently the whole idea is that he wants to cast younger for these roles because he wants to, the whole point is that he wants to cast actors for like, probably like eight to 10 year contracts. Yeah, probably. Because if he wants, if he wants to have a Superman, he probably wants to, and the hot idea is that this Superman is going to be telling the story of, of uh, this character at a younger age, like Superman year one, year two. So probably somebody who's like a, around their mid twenties or so. Henry Cavill, I think is 39 years old yeah. right now. Yeah. And by the time, this next Superman movie comes out, the guy's going to be in his early 40s. And over the next 10 years, as they make Superman movies, he's going to be in, into his 50s. So if you really think about it, um, for this new reboot, it doesn't make sense yeah. for Henry Cavill. However, he has already, if um, this is really geeking out, <laughs> but um, Gunn has hinted at a Superman multiverse in his recent tweet. He posted on his Twitter page an image of Superman, uh, the Superman Space Age comic, which deals with a multiverse catastrophe. And there's an image of multiple Superman. So there's a speculation 
that there's a chance uh, Henry Cavill could end up reprising his role in this new universe. Ooh. You know, perhaps even Brandon Routh, uh, maybe Dean Cain, <laughs> Tom Welling. You know, there. This could be going the the Spider-Man um, No Way Home route because um, they already are introducing with the new Flash movie. You know, multiple Batman because they you're, you're gonna have Ben Affleck and uh, Michael Keaton in that reprising their Batman roles. So think about I mean, it. That wouldn't be so bad. I, I like you know that idea. I don't know. It's not so. This may not be the main storyline, but I think there's uh, speculation that this is where they're going. That a multiverse of these superheroes, which gives them the leeway of bringing these old, these other actors from the Snyderverse back in if they want to. Mm. And I think the, I think the flash movie is going, is what the, is how they're spitting this so that it resets the DC universe and allows them to create this multiverse. And that's the idea. So. Yeah, well, see the, the good, I think the good thing overall, even though I know very little about it that I'm looking forward to is we've seen dc kind of flounder and be sort of hit or miss in recent years where they're trying to create that kind of marvel machine of interconnected stories and like yeah. character arcs flowing and i think that whatever james gunn does do it's clear that he'll have some kind of unified vision he's not just coming in there and saying let's do this let's make this and i mean i think he's trying to create like you're saying like a 10 year long narrative so yeah I look forward to it, even though I know nothing about it, just because I like him so much as an artist and what he's done with the Guardians movies. And he's such a great director that in general, I'm on board, even though I don't know what it is. I'm just glad that there's a mind and a vision over at DC that will hopefully create some spectacular entertainment. I mean, I loved I love what he did with Peacemaker and Suicide Squad. So I am actually looking. Yeah. Yes. Looking forward to his vision. This I'm excited about it new vision and he's got going there so sorry does anybody have any uh speculation or favorites that you'd like to see as the new superman or are we getting ahead of ourselves Ooh. any actors well i have it has I to be have somebody no young. idea at the moment yeah i'd have to think about that one there is there Me is personally some, there is some speculation um that uh, there's some online speculation for Glenn Powell, who if to be, I think he's a little old though for he. If you remember him, he was in uh, Top Gun Maverick. Um, Let's see, ah, oh. he was a he was a hang, hangman. If you remember, yes, that's right. Yeah, he, he's he's uh, one of the internet favorites. Um, Jacob Alordi from Euphoria. I, I'm just going off of some of the uh, websites that I've seen as sources. Jace Norman, who has a background with superheroes, with Nickelodeon show, Henry Danger. Um, I've seen pop up on a lot of websites. And David Corin Sweat, who I know nothing about, but he I keep seeing his name mentioned What's around. What's his name? David websites. what? David Corin, Corin Sweat. It, it keeps, I've seen on like five or six websites as... Uh, a fan choice as uh, uh, one of the favorites to play the next Superman. He's in his er, he's in his mid twenties right now, and um, you know you need this this tall, young, strapping guy to obviously play Superman bit, right now. You know, David looks a little bit like um, Henry. Mm -hmm. I can see him playing Superman. Yep. So, like I said, it, you know, James Gunn's direct is uh, writing this movie. It's not official that he's directing, but uh, we'll see. I mean, he's also supposed to be making uh, Peacemaker two in the next year or two, which I don't oh, wow. know if he's going to have time to do all this because he's laying the foundation for this universe. So I don't know how he's going to have time for all this. But I really hope he gets to do Peacemaker two because I really love that show. That was an awesome show. So, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, We'll, Snyder, we'll it's not. Um, what's his name? It, uh, isn't he coming up with the the True Detective series? Oh, I don't know. Is that what Snyder's up to now? I think so. Mm, I, 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 I don't know if I saw that on Twitter or somewhere, but I remember seeing that he's working on the the Green Lantern. I think. Oh, I don't know. Well, in the DC, in this new DC universe, there is going to be a Green Lantern 
show called Lanterns. I know that. Lanterns. I don't know much more about yeah. Lanterns. Green Lanterns, yeah. yeah. But then I thought I read somewhere that he's going to come up um, with a true detective series on HBO. So, oh, okay. Up and coming. So I I love true detective. That's cool. So um, second movie coming out is The Authority, uh, a group of superheroes that think the world is broken. Uh, this is a run, a uh, comic book run that was published between 99 and 2000. I know nothing about this. I'm not going to even speculate. I'm not going to talk about it because I don't know anything about The Authority. Never read it. I'm assuming you guys don't know either. Yeah. I do not. <laughs> let's let's move on. You know, this we are we are turning in our geek cards right here. The next thing has me very excited. This is called The Brave and the Bold. It's the official introduction of Batman to the new DCU. It's the story of Batman and his son, Damon Wayne, who um, is believed to be the new Robin. You know, we haven't seen Robin in a film in a long time since the Joel Schumacher days of Batman and Robin. So um, this it can't be any worse <laughs> than Batman and Robin. <laughs> so... Um, one no, thing we do know I did, is I Batman. Do, I, I'm sorry, Nathan. I do remember a Robin. Wasn't um, what's his name? That rapper there. Um, uh, Eminem. Eminem, yes. But what does that have to do with Batman? Am I missing something here? Wasn't he Robin? In, or maybe that's just the radio he created. I don't know. I. I don't pay attention to me. You're, you're, you're going to have to give us your source on this. <laughs> I'm on it. I'm on it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, well, Batman will not be played by Ben Affleck or nor um, Robert Pattinson from the Matt Reeves films. This is a completely separate Batman, not associated with those franchises. So we'll see. Oh, By so the way, this Bat is a completely separate DC Batman. Yes, there That's are so that many competing Batman universes going yeah. on here. We've got this. We've got Robert Pattinson's Batman with Matt Reeves, and you have this whole thing with Joker going on, which is not associated, apparently, with with uh, the Matt Reeves universe. I think the Matt Reeves Batman is going to be a, a trilogy is what I'm hearing about. That's going to be its own thing, kind of like the, the Christopher Nolan Batman movies. Yeah, I know they're working on part two already. Yeah, yeah, pat, part two. And I think that's going to be its own standalone thing. I think the Joker is going to be its own standalone thing. So that's, I think that's the way that's going. So uh, Batman part two is coming out in 2025. So all these Batman movies are coming out all around the same time and all disassociated with each other. It's, it's kind of kind of messed up but yeah which is more of a overarching yeah form so, to that <laughs> so yeah um lots of batman coming our way <laughs> no that's no <never> mind <laughs> it's eminem dressed in a costume as robin for one of his videos <laughs> <laughs> of course okay <laughs> i was wrong never mind all right um, the fourth film coming out is Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow. Um, this is based off the 2021 eight issue release. Um, you know, it hasn't been around for very long. So I, I don't know if fans of the comic books are really going to get into this because it's such a, a fresh story. Um, all we know is that, uh, James Gunn has revealed that unlike Superman who was sent to earth, and raised by a loving, loving parent, Supergirl was raised on a chunk, a chunk of Krypton floating in space and watched everyone in her life perish. And this made her a much more jaded character. So it's kind of the very different s story of a Kryptonian than Superman. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on Supergirl? Anyone a fan of the 1984? I'm not a fan of Supergirl. I don't, even, I don't think I've seen the film, to be quite honest. Yeah. I saw it a long, long time ago, and I have n almost no recollection of it. I don't think it was very good. <laughs> um, you, know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm thinking about this. Is there a chance of, of some di diversity with the casting for these movies as well? And I was thinking about Supergirl as an opportunity, you know, to cast Young and somebody... Um, 
of ethnicity for for some of these roles. And I'm wondering if they're going to do some of that for these for these roles. It would be nice um, to see that. It, it would be it would be yeah. nice. And I was thinking like, you know, thinking of you know actors like Zendaya Coleman or. Um, I love Zendaya. Some somebody like that as like Supergirl. You know, I I I know she's in the MCU universe to some degree. Um, maybe like Kuvijane uh, Wallace or something. she's a little young, but somebody I, I don't know. I, I'm wondering if they'll they'll do something like that. I hope that they take some chances like that for for these some of these major roles. It'd be kind of cool. I hope so too. I'd be more drawn to the movie if if they did. You know, I mean, because yeah. I know very little about it. Yeah. Yeah. So the fifth movie, I have to admit, is the one that I am most curious about and maybe the most excited for because it's been 40 years. Well, it's not been 40 years since Swamp Thing has been on in the movies, but I love Swamp Thing. And this actually, I think James Mangold has signed on to a direct. I don't know if that's official yet, but immediately I think uh, the news broke that he is in talks and maybe has signed on. But he has a, got a great track record, one of our best working directors right now. Uh, Copland, Girl Interrupted, Walk the Line. He's done all the recent Wolverine movies, Logan, Wolverine. He did Ford versus Ferrari. And the upcoming Indiana Jones film. So getting Mangold to do Swamp Thing, I am legitimately excited for. It's interesting, you know, even though I don't know much about Swamp Thing, when you were mentioning all those titles, Swamp Thing caught my attention much more so than the others. And I just yes. got, more, as I thought, ooh, the Swamp, like, because I remember, I just, it just something about it. Some of the other stuff to me, there's so much like, you know, superhero content in both DC and Marvel these days that I'm a little exhausted by it at times. Mm -hmm. um, and Swamp Thing just sounds fresh and exciting. And I don't know, he he lives in a swamp, right? Or does he come from there? <laughs> like I, there's a, if there's a swamp in it, that sounds good. <laughs> my, my, my only, uh, the only thing that I'm upset about is that the, Guillermo del Toro isn't directing Swamp Thing. That oh, would yeah, have been be amazing. so yeah. oh my amazing. God. Yes. I would have, I, yeah. That would have been, they missed that boat. I don't know if he would do a, a, a franchise movie again. I don't know. Maybe he would. Mm -hmm. Anyways, so, um, you know what I didn't realize until I was doing some research? I forgot about this. Wes Craven directed the original Swamp Thing. I completely forgot about this. It was this was before oh, wow, that's he right. did yeah. the movie he did before Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, it was interesting. So Swamp Thing is going to be horror focused film, and this is the whole point of this. I, I'm going to call it Phase One of this DCU called Gods and Monsters. So it's kind of shaping out this this way where it's going just to be the fact that it's horror focused too to me yeah. instantly gets my attention yeah. more. I mean, you know. Yeah. As someone who clearly does not know a lot about DC, so obviously take my opinion with a grain of salt, but Swamp Thing just seems to have more of a hook for me. Like, that interests me. Yeah. Excellent. All right, so that is what's going on with uh, the announcements for the DCU. And uh, more and more news is coming out. It seems like every week as to um, who's going to be in these movies and directing these movies. And I'm going to keep an eye on that because uh, I am very curious about what's happening over at DC. Even though I'm not as the hugest DC fan, I, I'm fascinated by what's happened over the last 10 years. It's been a, a beautiful train wreck with the Snyderverse in a lot of ways. And I am curious about what's going to happen over there now. So we'll see. All right. Let, Let's, let's move on to um, a couple of recommendations because uh, it's time to get to that. Um, you know, and um, to tie into this week's theme, for those of us that did watch To Leslie, you know, we, we had the story of a, of a single mom. And I wanted to kind of pick something that um, was, uh, like I said, tied in, and that was about single moms. And I wanted to challenge each of you to bring to our podcast this week a recommendation, one recommendation 
um, they give to our audience about a film that included a single mom. So can, who would like, who would like to go first? Um, I'll say, you know, originally I was going to cheat and I actually do have a movie. I was going to say, um, aliens because I love sci-fi, but even though it does not quite count because Newt is not, you know, um, Ellen Ripley's daughter in that film. So Sigourney Weaver is kind of a single mom, but not really. So the movie that I picked, um, is a 1996 thriller directed by Brian Gibson called The Juror with Demi Moore and her um, son is played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt. And it's funny, you know, I have a personal bias towards this movie. I liked it a lot, but I mean, I just Googled it. It has like a 22% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, but I saw it when I was like 15 years old. I was in Poland at the time and I had like a really good experience. So there's kind of an attachment, but I just thought it was a good thriller. She's a single mom. She's protecting her kid. I'm sure there are like plenty of more um, higher quality sort of best picture oriented films in that department. But I like the juror. Alec Baldwin is a villain that works for the mob and I just found it suspenseful um, and well-made. It's certainly not a deep film, but, I recommended it just because I I enjoyed it myself, and uh, yeah, I haven't seen this a long time, but I remember I almost have no memory of it. But I'm looking at the cover, and like, how is this not a John Grisham based you know, it, movie? It looks like it should be. It, like, it just it just was one of those movies that had <laughs> I I it's 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 nothing incredible. It just has like sequences where like she finds out that her house is bugged and so she and her son stop talking and then you can like see alan alec baldwin in the dark surrounded by all these speakers aware that they've stopped talking so there's like suspenseful scenes like that there's a cool climax i think it's like ah, somewhere in south america where they like try to escape the mob but they follow her and her son down there and it's just like it's it's decent it's totally like throwaway thriller but but it's totally fun. decent yeah <laughs> Well, that's uh, Sam's glowing recommendation of the Jura, a totally decent film. Yeah, Ellie, I, I had to pick that because of the you know <laughs> the single the the single mom thing. That's why I picked it. Otherwise, you know, right. I'd, I'd recommend a movie that I really really like, but that was okay. pretty good. Yeah, we're we're gonna make sure that we have um, a good post production meeting about what we're going to recommend next week so that we're not all disconnected on our recommendations and what we're going to watch. So we feel strong about our recommendations next week. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Ellie, give me one recommendation for, uh... Oh, by the way, the juror, I, I believe is it's not available for streaming anywhere, but it's on VOD. So you can get it on pretty much any of your, your uh, VOD apps like Apple or, where is it like Google or Amazon? You can rent it. So, Ellie, give me a uh, one recommendation that you well, want to share. for me. I have to say it's the room, or not the room, room. room. I Sorry. think you're trying it's to say room. yes. Yeah. Very different. Movie. Yeah, you're right. The room is a different. Uh, it's room, and it's the story yes. of the of the young girl that got kidnapped when she was 17 years old, and yes. she had to live in like basically a box room for years um until her son was about five years old and um she was able to manage to get him outside um and i, I don't want to give too much of the movie in case someone has not seen the movie but um it's just one of those movies that for me it was the connection again uh, uh this mom young girl uh to survive the will to survive in that room and she, what she has to go through with her kidnapper every single day, he comes into that room to do whatever he wants for her. And and the boy is right there watching and hearing. And, you know, um, he, he basically was born there in that room, you know? And, and so she, uh, they, they have such a strong bond between mom and son. And I am a sucker for films that have a single mom and a son because, you know, I'm a single mom with a son. 
<laughs> so I, to me, those are I'm always attracted to those type of films because it's it's that survivor um, sort of idea that a mom does, and you know, uh, and I always find them so heartfelt. And this movie, you might you might have actually liked to Leslie. I'm just saying, ah, you might have, you might have enjoyed it. Try yeah. to sell me. <laughs> <laughs> to Leslie, not because she is a single mom, so it was it had that strong element. Anyway, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. No, thank you. No, but I don't know. Yeah. It's just like I don't know. I've seen too many feels where the mom is an alcoholic because she's not. Like, yeah, yeah, right? she is, and she's like a depressing, like really like down the drain alcoholic. Like you know, can't do anything. Yeah, yeah, it's gr- it's grim. Yeah, and I think uh, the the mom, um, Bria Bria Larson. I think it is yeah Brie Larson, Brie Larson she she does such a wonderful job in this film you know and she won um best actress that year for this role. there you go there you go she's wow yeah I totally recommend this if you have not watched Room <laughs> let me say it correctly Room um I definitely recommend it I think it's streaming on Netflix mm-hmm. right it's um right now it's streaming on HBO Max okay and um, you can also get it on Canopy for those of you who take advantage of your Canopy accounts. I actually do use that. It's uh, you get f- free movies through your library. It's a great service. For free, right? There. Yeah. Okay. And Hulu too, yeah. I think. I didn't see it on Hulu, but I saw it on HBO Max. Oh, and actually, you Canopy. have a Hulu uh, sus- subscription. You can hmm. watch it there. Perfect. Um, and uh, Amazon Prime too, if you have a subscription, which I happen to have it. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, absolutely one of those films that it stays with you, you know, it stays with you. And I think this uh, was based on a, uh, inspired by true stories of crime. So. Well, this is an excellent pick, Ellie. I, I did see this uh, several years ago and I, it was it's a heart wrenching film and I uh, yeah. remember it was a it was a tough it was a tough watch. All right, um, my recommendation this week um, is the 1982 animated feature film, The Secret of Nim. Mm-hmm. This I is... love that movie so much. <laughs> I love that movie. Sam Cole loves that movie. Sam Cole loves that movie. <laughs> podcast, podcast. Sorry. Well, I have not the... seen that movie. This oh, is, you would love it. It's so good. This is the first uh, feature from the great Don Bluth. Um, he used to be an uh, animator over at Disney before he left, and he went off on his own to create his own production company. This came out, I think, when I was like eight years old, and, and I remember it was uh, a lean period for animation when this was coming out. This was the dark ages for Disney when their studio was struggling to put out films that appeared to you know my generation you know during that decade so during a lot of the 80s other studios besides disney were able to find an audience within the animation landscape you know the other, another that comes to mind around this time was the last unicorn i don't know if you remember that one yeah and the black cauldron which i think was a disney movie the but, dark tim burton disney movie yeah, yeah. steven spielberg and, actually produced two other don bluth movies uh american tale and the land yes, before time yeah yes no so it would be another seven years or so before the little mermaid would come out and disney would just swallow the entire animation market for the most part but you know very interesting films were coming out around this time and this was a very dark story about a family of mice. Uh, the mother, Mrs. Brisby, is a widow. Her husband died previously, and she is left to raise her children, children of mice, but she soon learns that their home is in danger of being destroyed by the farmer's plow that will be tilling the field that spring. However, she can't move the family quite yet because her youngest son is very sick, and that's only half the plot. It involves a very complex story about the rats of Nim which her late husband had a relationship with. They are this in- intelligent society of rats who escaped from a lab, who formed the society in a nearby rose bush. This film has it all. It has like this political power struggles, magical, mystical arts. It's and, so epic too. Yeah. It's so and epic. <laughs> at the heart, it's this, really it's a story of about a mother who will do anything and everything it takes to save her family. And this film is an adaptation of the 1971 children's novel, Mrs. Frisbee 
and the Rats and Nim by Robert C. O'Brien. And I understand they changed the character's name from Frisbee to Brisbee, uh, not to create confusion about with the circular round disc that you toss around in your backyard. <laughs> Makes sense, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, also of note, this um, uh, has some early voice work from two of the Brisbee children in this film, Will Wheaton and Shannon Doherty are are, are in this when they're just little kids. You wouldn't recognize their voices because they have like little tiny voices. But um, it also has <laughs> wonderful voice acting from the great Dom Deluise Re- yes. uh, playing the side character of the crow Jeremy. Um, it has fantastic voice acting all around. Um, famed English actor Sir Derek Jacoby plays Nicodemus. Um, John Carradine is the great owl in one of the most chilling scenes um, I witnessed as a young child. It gave me nightmares, uh, the, the the great owl. And he, um, it's fantastic. The, the voice acting is just incredible all around. Um, it's, it's like, Nothing like you've seen in a Disney movie. If if you're just used to like the traditional 2D animated Disney movies, you have to see The Secret of Nim. If you haven't, it's um, like Jerry you said, Goldsmith's it's, soundtrack is incredible <coughs> too. The music sorry. is just amazing. It's epic. Like no other Disney movie um, that's come before or after it. So um, me and Sam both highly recommend The Secret of Nim. It's uh, it's dark. It's epic. <laughs> And um, I watched this movie, I taped it off at of HBO onto a tape, and I wore the tape out growing up. See, that's the thing. I watched it, my VHS copy of it. I I grew up with that movie as well. Yeah. So I just like, I just love it. And the, all the creepy, dark stuff, like it appealed to me as a kid. The world mm-hmm. was like dangerous and scary. It was like frightening in a way good children's movies can be. And I like it when a children's movie is like willing to go toward the dark not like crazy sadistic dark like nothing like that it's just rich and creepy in tone and there's danger all over the meadow and around the house just the whole world of that movie was fascinating to me yeah your parents let you watch those oh yeah i my i saw jaws when i was five um (laughs) yeah close to saw terminator 2 in the theater when i was 10 like four i mean i saw my father loves movies as well so he just (laughs) I watched all of that stuff and it just, I just absorbed it like a sponge. I love that movie. Yeah. Yeah, That was not allowed in my house. (laughs) (laughs) So um, Secret Nim actually is streaming in a lot of places. You could, it's actually on Roku, um, Tubi, Canopy, Pluto and ads. um, Some of the free places you can find it with ads right now. But you can also obviously uh, rent it on VOD uh, anywhere as well. Is uh, the Secret of Nim two streaming as well? The direct, I have no idea. Direct to video I... 1998 film with terrible reviews, and <laughs> Ralph Macchio plays uh, <laughs> Timothy Brisby, I think, all grown up, and he's gone yeah. to Thorn Valley. So, never seen it. Yeah, never seen. I saw it, part never of it once, well. and I think it was like you know, you know, I, it, you know so yeah. I, I can tell how much Nathan loves this movie because he was so passionate passionately speaking about it <laughs> oh for sure oh absolutely yeah it's an all-time favorite yeah so those are our recommendations this week and uh yeah just want to say that so that we're about at the end of the show i just want to say this upcoming week if anybody is out there looking for some new things coming out um this weekend magic mike's last dance uh, comes out this weekend. Steven Soderbergh's return to the Magic Mike universe with uh, Channing Tatum and Selma Hayek. Um, Ellie, I think this was on your list of one of the most anticipated yeah, movies of the year for you. It is. You're going to be first in line, as, front and center. As much as I want to watch, um, you know, knock, knock at the door. Did I say that right? You can see that one too. <laughs> I'll see both, right? <laughs> Knock at the cabin. Not, not, knock at the cabin. Yeah. I yeah. really want to go see that one. So I, I'm probably going to see that one before I see Magic Mike. Or maybe okay. I'll see both. Depends on how much time I have. Yeah. Knock at the also, cabin uh, dethroned Avatar 2, which ran mm-hmm. for seven weeks at number one. But it was also M. Night Shyamalan's lowest box office opening, if I read that mm-hmm. article correctly. Are you yeah. sure? Fascinating times we live in. 
his uh, his lowest opening weekend of all his of all his M Night Shyamalan films. I'm I surprised, think. even like some of the early ones, like The Visit, where he's like really really low budget. Yeah, I mean, interesting. Okay, I, I'll have to fact check that, but it's yeah. I just read that. Yeah. Okay. Also coming out this weekend is the I guess it would be the 25th anniversary re-release in 3D. Yeah, no, Titanic is coming out. Not happening. <laughs> oh wow! I'm, I'm just letting you know if uh, you need to see Titanic in 3D, yeah. especially IMAX 3D, uh, you can go do that. Which means that this weekend, Titanic and Avatar: Way of Water are going to be battling it out. <laughs> Two James Cameron movies, <laughs> which me I think will be the third and fourth highest grossing movies are going to be in the theater at the same time. Yeah. Think about crazy. that. You think people are gonna go watch Titanic in 3D? Oh, uh -huh. oh yeah, yep. Uh huh. Absolutely. That, that, that movie. That, that movie's movie gonna make will another never, ever sink. <laughs> that movie is gonna make Sorry. another 70, 80 million dollars. I bet. And what's gonna happen is Avatar: The Way of Water is gonna pass Titanic for about two days in the box office, and then Titanic is gonna take it back over again. Is your prediction, Nathan? Yes. Okay. Okay. We'll see. Right. We'll keep an eye on the box office. <laughs> Um, also coming out in wide release, and I don't know much about it, is a horror thriller uh, consecration from writer-director Christopher Smith. I don't know much about it, but that is in wide release. And coming to um, an A24 limited release is Sharper, which kind of looks interesting. It's um, starring Julian Moore. It's a neo-noir thriller from director Benjamin Caron. Caron? Nathan, check this out when you get a chance. Not maybe not for this podcast, but um, um, you mentioned A twenty four. There's a horror film in development called Back Rooms, and it was like developed by the seventeen year old kid who has a YouTube channel, and it's based off this. I hate um, him already. I know, yeah, but um, <laughs> um, but literally, I've seen some of these videos, and they they like, I think they bought. I don't know the details, but but um, it's based off a um like it's just literally this kid was filming something and it's like back rooms is this other dimension this like nondescript office building that you fall into with like endless corridors and there's some like monster roaming around it and it's got that like found footage vibe mm. but um i was kind of looking into that today it could be interesting it might not be a while till it's made but um yeah okay back rooms back rooms it's a thing too it's like an urban legend Hmm. Got it. Okay. And the last two things I'll just mention coming out, if lest you, if you don't want to go out to the theater, coming to Netflix is uh, uh, the Reese Witherth Witherspoon star, Your Place or Mine. Um, it's a rom-com and directed by Arlene Brosh McKenna, who has got, is, I think it's her directorial debut. She's done a lot of... Um, rom written a lot of rom-coms in the past decade or so and the last thing i just want to mention uh is somebody i used to know a new feature from dave franco we all know dave franco he's got a feature film he directed starring allison brie another uh rom-com a lot of rom-coms well it's valentine's day so you know they're all hitting the streamers right now <laughs> by the way i didn't have my my phone in front of me a moment ago but one quick thing with back rooms it's the Backrooms is an urban legend and creepy pasta, which originated in a 2019 4chan thread about unsettling images. So it just started as some like picture that someone posted and the mythology of it grew. And now there's just like tons of YouTube videos about how you can fall into this Backrooms universe. I don't know why I'm obsessed with it, but I just started looking at it today and I'm like, oh, interesting. Anyway, you are obsessed with that. Yeah. Because it's just, I like, I just like the idea of like falling through a wall and like <laughs> going somewhere else, you know. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that does it for this week's episode of Back to the Frame Rate. How long is, was this episode? Were we shorter? <laughs> <laughs> we're probably maybe by a few minutes, but we're what's, almost on par of last week. We'll, uh, what's the time counter? Can we'll, you still we'll get see there. Your um, it's hard to tell right now. I hope my That's voice right, wasn't yes. as loud as it was yet last week. I think we all sounded amazing. <laughs>
if you come and listen to the podcast next week, you're going to win a million dollars and that's legitimate. So you're going to have to now. What are you going to pay? <laughs> just, just, just kidding. You won't win anything. No, I'm not going to pay anything. <laughs> no money. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I don't well, have a million dollars. Well, thank you everyone for tuning into this week's show. Back to the frame rate is part of the Western media podcast network. Please subscribe, rate and review on iTunes or Apple podcast. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at back to the frame rate and on Twitter at back frame rate. I think we need to get a better handle for that Twitter one. But anyways, you can email us directly at back to the frame rate at gmail.com. So tune in next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>